Hey everybody, this is Peter and this is the new 2023 Piaggio MP3 HPE or 530 HPE exclusive. It's a big name, the big difference is new engine, new technology. It's one of the most exciting bikes that I've reviewed all year and it's not a bike, it's a trike. So most of the videos you're gonna see on this vehicle are gonna show you exactly what I'm showing you now. The really cool way it turns and steers and does all that kind of stuff. And in those videos, they're probably not gonna be able to touch on some of the stuff that I'm gonna touch on on this vehicle. So if you're interested in this vehicle, what I'm gonna to try to do is show you a whole bunch of things that the other videos aren't showing you because this thing is loaded with tech and some of it just needs an explanation and that's what I do here. I make sure I go in depth and give full explanations of what these are, who they're good for, why they work, what's not so great about them. I try to give you as best a review as I can and I can do that because I am partnering with Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals, Jim Gilbert's Power Sports, and they give me complete access to their entire vehicle lineup. So if you have questions about this vehicle, especially this newest one with the newer engine and the newer technology, make sure you subscribe and let me know in the comments the kinds of things that you wanna know about this. I've driven the 500, I've driven this 530 now, and uh, I have some comparisons in mind, and I also just generally like what this is. I think this is good for a whole lot of people, and I think this is great for people who maybe aren't ready to step into the motorcycling world. I think Piaggio has sold about 230,000 of these things since they started in 2006. This, of course, the 2023 model, has a lot of updates. These are actually very popular around the world, less popular here in North America, but of course we sell a bunch of them here at Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals. So what I'm gonna do is go really in depth with this and try to help you understand both what's new and why it's great. So let's start with that right now. So let's start with the whole concept of why you would want a three-wheeled vehicle. Well, first of all, there's a couple different types of three-wheeled vehicles. There's this one here, which we're gonna talk about in detail. There's also something like a Harley Davidson with the trike, which has two wheels in the rear. And then there are things like Can-Am with the three wheels, uh, the two wheels in the front and one in the rear. A big, big, big difference with this is the way it works. So let's just talk about Harley Davidson. Most of your braking is done in the front wheel and most of it has the, uh, you know, most of the traction there is in the rear wheels. So they kind of corner weird and they're not as good for braking simply because as the weight transfers forward, you don't have a whole lot of road contact. Then you have the other side of things, the Can-Am version, which of course has a lot of road contact in braking, which is fantastic. However, when you go around a corner, it kind of tries to throw you off. And there's an other disadvantage to both of those vehicles that this one doesn't suffer from, aside from the fact that this leans, which we'll get into in a second. Both of those take up three tracks in the road. So if you think about a car, left side track, right side track. If you think about a trike, the wider ones, they go on your left side track, the right side track, and the center track, which means every single bump in that road, they are hitting. They cannot avoid it. You go left side, you go right side, you go front side. It doesn't matter. Anywhere in the road, if there's a bump, you're going to be feeling it. This one, the wheels are much narrower. So you're really going down one track of the road. You've got independent suspension in the front here, so they can each handle that kind of thing, but you're not feeling every single bump in the road the same way because you can go down a single track, much like a motorcycle, because those front wheels are narrow. The other big difference is leaning allows you to stay on the vehicle in a corner. Now, why do three wheels at all? First of all, you do three wheels because you have great all-weather traction. So great traction anyways. If the road gets a little gravelly or if the road gets a little bit wet, these things are absolutely amazing. And it's not just that they have three wheels. There's a whole bunch of electronics that also come to play. And we're gonna talk about those in this video. So why go for this? Well, first of all, this is a relatively compact, relatively fuel efficient. I mean, it looks huge here, uh, but it's not that big to drive, not that big to manage, but this is a bike that you can do everything on and frankly, this is probably more high tech than your economy car and it gets better economy. It gives you the same kind of you know, features and in fact, probably more technological features than many economy cars. And it's fun. It is an absolute blast to drive. It's really, really fun. So again, I'm gonna show you that me spinning around just there in the parking lot. It's the only place I've sort of filmed with this one. Um, it's going around in the parking lot there. 
I was going really slowly, but the point is with that front wheel grip, you can turn much quicker, you have some confidence in the corner, and you legit have contact in that corner, and that's what makes this a lot of fun. But we're gonna talk about whether you're a motorcyclist or a car person. Uh, this has features that work really well for both, especially in the braking system. So let's start breaking down some of the details in this. And actually, you know what? We should start with that new engine. So let's start with that. So I'm gonna sit across this right now as we talk about the engine because I don't wanna to have to talk too much about seating position. You'll be able to see that it is incredibly comfortable. So let's talk about the engine. 530 instead of 500, so it's a little bit larger engine. Sometimes larger engine can lead to worse fuel efficiency. That's not the case here. So this is what this has got. The new engine is both more horsepower, more torque, better fuel efficiency, and it's quieter. That's kind of the holy grail of everything you're looking for in an engine. So you've got all that, which is good. Now it's not a whole lot more horsepower or a whole lot more torque, but it reaches both of those power numbers about 500 cc lower in the rev range. So it gets to your peak number quicker and it has a little bit more power as well. All of that leads up to better acceleration than it's had in the past. So better acceleration, of course, more fun. Now these things as well are limited in their top speed. They go about 145 kilometers an hour, which for any kind of driving on this type of vehicle is all you need. But what that means is they can gear this really appropriately for that range of riding. A lot of motorcycle riders, they expect their bikes to go 200, 200 plus kilometers an hour and they have to gear those bikes for that. So this one is geared for efficiency and drivability where you actually drive it. That makes a huge difference in how it works. And again, we talk about quiet, unlike a motorcycle, this one is extremely quiet, not just at idle, but also at acceleration. So they have um, some sound information on it. And uh, a lot of bikes can now idle quietly, but as they accelerate, they make a lot of noise. This thing, they compared it to the previous version and even at, I think it was like 30 or so miles an hour, it's significantly quieter. So that's just kind of a nice thing to have. It's very automotive like that. The other difference you're gonna have compared to a motorcycle, on my motorcycle, I have a big gas tank up here, and then I have a big engine up here. On something like a scooter, you have the engine way down low. That keeps the weight centralized, it keeps the weight low, which actually assists in handling as well. It makes this bigger vehicle feel quite light. Now you can see right now, I've got it balanced on the wheels. I can unlock it and balance it like a motorcycle. Uh, you can do all kinds of things uh, with it. You can put it on the center stand, you can do all different things, but it is very easy to manage for a heavier vehicle. So even though you see the specs and they show it's a little bit heavier than the traditional motorcycle, it's really no harder to handle. And in fact, because of the front wheels, it becomes uh, much, much easier to handle in that situation. So you've got a better engine here. CD position's great. While I'm here, I'll just point out the rear seat is massive. The largest rear seat out of any vehicle we have here that doesn't have four wheels. Uh, very, very uh, large seat. So very good comfort for driver, for passenger. You can add accessories, that kind of thing. Now let's dig into some of the specifics. So let's start sort of where all the complicated stuff is. And it's actually really not that complicated. It's pretty simple stuff, uh, but it works in a really cool way. So of course, as you can see right now in the video, we'll just throw up again. When you turn, this thing leans and it leans and really feels like a motorcycle. But of course the benefit is extra grip overall. So let's talk about what you have here. Take a look back here. The wheels are exposed. They look cool. They've got a cool little design in here. They're fairly lightweight and they're very strong. You have Michelin tires. They're 13 inch tires in the front, 14 inch in the back. Now you might think 13 inch tires, not that big. Uh, I used to drive a car with 14 inch wheels, uh, 14 inch wheels again. Um, and 15 was the larger upsize wheels. So, I mean, these are still pretty good size for what they are. And because there's two of them, because they can lean, they are traditional motorcycle tires. These are, like I said, Michelin. They've got good grip for the all weather. So the biggest benefit is when you're stopping on a motorcycle, virtually all of your braking power is done on your front wheels and a contact patch on a motorcycle because the curved wheel and because of the, you know, the smaller diameter is very small. So you've doubled your contact uh, area and it doesn't matter what angle you're on, you've got double what you would have in a traditional motorcycle. That makes a huge difference in braking and steering, obviously. I think that's pretty obvious to most people. But where you'll see the benefit is in the rain. Now you've got a lot of things going for you. Simple things like there's a lot more tread here than on a typical motorcycle. So it's good uh, rain dissipation there. You've even got the fenders that come around the outside a little bit extra here. Traditionally a scooter, you already have this protection just from back here from rain, but these 
uh, mud flaps and, and fenders go all the way down. This is sort of a uh, flexible one down here. They even have venting in here to let the air through, but continue to keep that rain and everything off as you're turning, as you're leaning, as you spin the wheel. So very good weather protection, which means you're going to stay very dry even on wet roads. So you could drive this in the rain, throw on a rain suit, and you're good to go uh, with the rain coming down, but you're not going to get the dirty rain on you, which is the stuff that comes up off the road. So everything about this is good. And then they have ABS brakes. And of course it has a traction control system as well. So if you're thinking about driving this in virtually all weather, now I'm not sure about driving in the winter, but I know some people around the world do, but if you're driving this in virtually all weather, you've got a lot of things going for you. Also big style, big motorcycle brakes, a lot of motorcycles, like my motorcycle is a fairly quick bike. It has a dual disc system. So two discs on either side of the front wheel. This one is also a dual disc system. So have a disc on this wheel and a disc on that wheel. So strong braking, strong capability. Everything about this in theory is better than a motorcycle. The, de the negative is the weight, but I don't think the weight matters for this style of vehicle. So now let's talk about activating those brakes. This is a weird vehicle. It's going to appeal to automotive people. It's going to appeal to motorcycle people. And what I find funny is I drove my motorcycle in today and the motorcycle has a front brake lever and it has a foot pedal. And you can use the front brake lever and the foot pedal. If you're used to driving a scooter, you have a brake lever here and a brake lever there. And this one has that. And if you're used to driving a car, you're not used to brake levers at all. You just use your foot pedal. What's cool about this is the foot pedal is a linked braking system. So if you're used to driving a car, you can just press, press that. If you are used to driving a, um, uh, motorcycle, then you can use your front brake and your rear brake. It's not going to matter. And the brake over here is really nice because this also has a center stand. So the brake on this side allows you to keep this vehicle because it can easily roll if you don't put on the main parking brake. But if you're going to put it on the center stand, you still have a brake on this side of the vehicle, where, which is where you put it on the center stand, which gives you extra control as well if it's on a hill because, you know, like I said, it can roll away. So Overall braking application, very good as well. Let's start taking a look at some of the technology in this vehicle now. So if we're gonna show you technology, we should show you the key fob. Much like an automotive key fob, it is a keyless entry. There's an ignition switch that you can turn, but you just have the key fob on with you. Now I'm not maybe close enough, so I'm gonna kind of activate it here. We're gonna turn this uh, screen on here, and there we go. All right, let's see if we can get some of that glare out of there. Not too bad, yeah, there we go. All right, so the screen can be a darker screen like you're seeing now, or it can be a lighter screen. And there's a whole bunch of information in here. We won't go through every piece of it, but we'll show you some of the basics. Obviously this updated screen, it's got a tachometer. Like I said, when I was outside with it, it was uh, white in color, sort of the colors were inverted. Everything you need is kind of right here. And I should point out, this is a very, very large screen. It's hard to show you that size of a screen on camera there. Um, but you know, if you put my hand down here with the watch, I don't know if you can kind of get a sense of, how big that is, but very large, very easy to read. And there's a number of different ways you can customize the display. So you see the A is on the bottom lit up. You can set up to B, you can set up to C, um, you know, a bunch of different modes in there. You've got navigation not available right now. You've got your phone connected there. You've got your music connected there, which is, needs an app. Then you've got your uh, automatic slip regulation, which is essentially traction control is in the sport mode. And then you've got a number of settings in here, which, you know what, let's just pop them open for a second and we'll show you them there. So we set up language, configuration, uh, those kind of things. Let's go back to, let's go to configuration actually. We'll select that one. Clock, units, parking or pairing configuration, LCDAS. Let's talk about that. That is your lane keep, uh, lane change decision. We'll keep it on there. Let's just go down. Lane change decision assistance system. What that is, is a pretty advanced system. We're going to go back to the uh, main menu and talk about that right now. So what you have with that lane change decision assist system is essentially what I would call blind spot detection and it helps you in a number of ways. So instead of looking on your mirrors like your car, you're going to have some warning lights on the sides of the screen here, right or left side, to warn you if there are people in your blind spot. Now that can warn you while you're signaling, it can warn you in advance. So 
it allows you to know, it's, it's kind of weird because there's no blind spot on the car and maybe that's why they don't call it, um, you know, blind spot detection in the same way, that lane change decision assist system. Uh, but you, if you don't want to turn your head or you just turn your head at a glance, it just gives you an extra warning with a little orange indicator on either side of the screen there to warn you that someone is in your way. And in a busy city environment, that is super helpful to tell at a glance. And the nice thing is it'll show up in your peripheral vision uh, that something is there. So if you don't see them in your mirror and you don't see them with your shoulder check, even before your shoulder check, you'll see in your peripheral vision that there is a system there that warns you. And that is a nice sort of radar type system. The other thing that's pretty cool here as we uh, show you the screen is I'm gonna have to turn the vehicle to the uh, to on and I'm gonna throw a reverse and hopefully it'll show very well. So normally I don't start a vehicle inside here, but we're gonna do that real quick. Uh, oops, gotta hit the brake here, start the vehicle up. So again, it sounds louder in here. We go into reverse there and you actually have a backup camera there, which you can see here. I'm waving at it, uh, where are we, down there? Uh, so you can sort of see that there is a true backup camera that you can see very clearly and uh, it's just like your car. So let's talk about that for just a second here. Turn it off there. So the backup camera is useful for a number of things. Let me talk about that. So I mentioned that this vehicle has sold over 200,000 vehicles like it worldwide. And of course, a lot of the places they sell is very, very busy cities. So filming here in North America, our cities are a little more spaced out and you maybe don't think you need a backup camera on something like this and maybe you don't, but keep in mind when you're on this thing, you don't have to necessarily put your legs down. You don't have to necessarily get off and other stuff. And if you're backing up and you want to be really close to a car or something else, you can kind of pay attention to what's around you by looking at your dash. And it's easier to move this thing, as you can see, by staying right here and not doing this as much. So being able to see that you need those extra couple inches there, and then you want to turn out and go this way, being able to see that with your backup camera is good. It's also helpful for just parking it in a garage. You can just be able to see things better. So while I don't think the backup camera is needed for my riding, I can tell you already I've used it and thought, yep, that's handy. That's something that uh, I appreciate having there. So they're mandated on cars in North America, obviously not on motorcycles or anything like that. But it's funny how our brains get used to having them. Once it's there, it becomes something where, you know what, that is helpful, that is useful. Especially as the vehicle's running, maybe your dog's running around or you got kids' toys or something like that. Having a little extra view where you can see directly behind you, and you can see this is fairly tall, you can see directly behind you, it is something that is helpful. So we've talked about the popularity of this as a city vehicle, and I think that makes a lot of sense. It's smaller than a car, it can park just about anywhere, and you know, that's just helpful. It's easy to whip, whip through traffic, even lane splitting. It's not really much wider than a typical motorcycle, uh, or certainly a wider motorcycle. Uh, so you can lane split where you're legal. Of course, you can't do that in Canada. Where I think this makes sense in North America is as a touring vehicle. So a touring vehicle needs a couple things. First of all, it's gotta be comfortable. It just has to, has to be comfortable. And you can see, like I said, when I was on this, I don't have the parking brake on, let's put that on right now. This is a very, very comfortable ride. You've got nice square uh, seating position, and then a touring vehicle should also be able to take that wind off you. And you have a wide windshield here, where if you're on a motorcycle, you wanna be able to see over that windshield, but you want that windshield to give you enough, enough wind protection that it kinda, the wind goes over your helmet and around your body. And this is shaped narrow here for where your helmet would hit the wind, a little bit wider for where your body would hit the wind, and it works very well for protecting you from that area. The other thing this has that makes it good for a long distance trip is cruise control. It works just like your car, it's electronic cruise control. Set that cruise, keep going. You can sort of relax on the throttle a little bit and just kind of cruise and hang on and you know talk. This rear seat passenger is ex or seat here is excellent. So let's just show you what that's like. We've got foot pegs there that flop out. And what we'll do is I'll jump on here. You can see because it doesn't need a center stand, you can put it on the center stand. Uh, you can jump out and let me just sort of go back further. The seat here is massive. So you can put a top box back on here, have a backrest. This is comfortable. You're taller and tall enough that you can see over the rider in front of you but you probably won't find another scooter or even many other motorcycles that are this comfortable for longer distance. And again, a little bit extra torque, a little extra horsepower. It's already got enough power to do what you want to up to that 145 km hour speed limit because it's built for that. So you can absolutely tour on this. The other thing you need on a touring motorcycle is storage. So let's talk about the storage in this thing right now. 
So even though this is balanced on two wheels, before we open the storage thing, usually what I do with any motorcycle that I need to put luggage in there is I put it on the center stand. That gives you a little extra balance back here. Again, you don't need to with this, but I want to show you how easy it is. Just two fingers here, I push down, and it's up. It's very, very simple. You don't have to be strong or heavy or anything else to put it up on a center stand, so you can do that. Now let's take a look inside the luggage area. So taking a look at the seat, there's a number of ways to tap it. You can double tap that remote there on the bottom there, the unlock button. I'm going to put that in my pocket and I'm just going to touch the button on the dash as well. So there's that option there. You can pop it up and it is sort of uh, self-lifting. It has a little uh, piston there that helps lift it up so you can see that it's easy. Now I could position my helmet in a number of different ways in here. Uh, is it deep enough to fit a full face helmet? Yes, they say it fits multiple helmets. I'm not sure if it would fit two full face helmets. It probably would if you just position them around differently. Uh, but the point is, there's a lot of storage in there, and that's what you need in a modern touring bike is a lot of storage. Now, if it was me and you were touring with two people, I would still put a top box on the back to give your passenger a backrest. But you really do have a lot of storage in here. And what's kind of nice is this little uh, felt kind of piece in the bottom here that sort of shapes up like that. It is removable, but of course, it's going to keep everything from rattling around in there. So a good amount of width, a good amount of length, good amount of depth. You can fit all kinds of stuff, even without a top box, right there. And of course, it's lockable storage, which is super helpful as well, because you can just leave your stuff in there. Uh, and you can usually put your helmet and your stuff in there. It's pretty big stuff. It's pretty useful. One of the other storage things that's very common on scooters, Piaggio has this on virtually everything, is you have space between your legs here to hang something like a backpack, a shopping bag, something like that, and have it between your legs and sort of clips into there and holds on. So you do have that even on this MP3. The center section is a little higher than on some of the other Piaggio scooters where it can be as, as low as a flat floor, but you have a space to put this uh, down here. It's positioned a little bit to the left. I think that's partly because the ignition switch is there, but it also does keep things away from your brake pedal, which is kind of nice because you can brake with your brake pedal there as well. So again, good positioning, good stuff here. Let's show you some of the other controls on this bike now. So taking a look at the left side, normally this would be a clutch lever on a regular motorcycle. That's a brake lever, same as a regular scooter. You have this little position out here, which can uh, be your high beam light there. So trigger to flash and pull it, push it on to keep it on. Up at the very top of your screen, you will see the cruise control, which is accelerate, decelerate, and uh, turn it on and off right there. So pretty simple stuff there. This controls a number of the menu systems in that display that we talked about before. And then exactly where you want them is your signal switch and your horn switch, exactly where they should be. Now, most touring motorcycles have a secondary set of controls further inside that are hard to reach. This one doesn't have that because it has bodywork it can use. So again, because it's a different style of motorcycle, you have some switches down here. Let's just zoom right into those right now. Quick zoom, there we go. This is your drive and reverse. Very simple to go forward, very simple to throw in reverse. It's just an electronic button there. This button here is what I use to pop the, um, the uh, seat there. And then you have the button to pop your gas uh, area as well so you can fill it with fuel. Let's check the other side as well. So taking a look at the same type of view, again, if you've never driven a motorcycle or anything else before, this is pretty simple. Gas and brake, and that's all you need right there. Of course, you don't need to use that brake. You can use the foot lever or foot pedal, just like in a car if you want. And then you have traditional motorcycle stuff. So this here, yeah, well, I say traditional motorcycle stuff. This is actually probably important to do. We'll talk about this in one second. Start button, kill switch, that's traditional motorcycle stuff. You have the um, button up here, which is your hazard or warning lights. And then again, down here, a little bit interesting to me. This is the exclusive model, which you'll be able to see. Quick zoom here, you'll see the exclusive. You have slip, automatic slip regulation, or I think that's what the ASR stands for, essentially your traction control, a dummy switch here, and a potential dummy switch here. Now, possibly extra lighting you can add here. I'm not sure what those buttons do. If you guys are in Europe, maybe you guys know more than I do what these uh, buttons could be used for. I apologize, I haven't looked that up. Now, let's talk about the one different button right here. So, because this is a leaning device, I want to try to get in there as best I can. The way this works is if I pull this this way, it will unlock the locked steering. So we're going to talk about this in a second, but I want to show you what you do. This locks it like that, and again, it's right by your throttle hand. You can reach it very easily. So unlock and lock. Let's talk about how that works right now. So as we talk about the lock and unlock, we need to understand how a motorcycle steers. When it is stationary like this, I can move it around and you can see the wheels are turning like that, and that's pretty typical stuff. Turn it right, it goes right. On a regular motorcycle, you actually 
push this way to lean the bike over and it goes around a corner because it's leaning. Because this leans, it steers like a regular motorcycle. So on those other three wheel devices where you're turning always towards your turn and kind of have that feeling like you're gonna be thrown off the thing if you take a fast corner, this one, it turns by leaning in. So the suspension here allows the front wheels to move up and down and turn like this. So when it, you know, one will have to move up, one will have to move down like that to lean left or right. And this lock button that I just showed you will allow you to lock that bike in any position. So if you're going around a corner and you want to lock or you're coming to a stop in a corner, and you want to lock the wheels, it will do it sideways. It is not only going to lock 90 degrees to the ground or to, you know, actual ground. And the reason that's useful is you can be on uneven roads. You can be in a real, you know, pothole area or a real dip in the road and you can lock the vehicle upright even though the wheels are quite turned. So it's basically gonna say, hey, if you wanna lock the bike like this in the upright position, you can do that. If you wanna lock it like this in the upright position, you can do that. But if it's uneven like this, it will also lock in any position. So the reason that's important is like I said, you can lock it upright every time. Now it's confusing to people, why would it lock on the edge? And that's really because it's saying, hey, I don't know if I'm leaning or if the wheel's just in a dip. You want it locked on that angle, I will lock it on that angle. So if you're parking, for instance, like I am now, on an angled road, you could lock it leaning up the hill, straight up the hill, or square to the ground, it can still do that. So it's really helpful to be able to lock this at any angle because of the, the angle on the ground. So you can come to a stop and hit that button and never have to put your feet down. What I would say to most people riding this is be ready to put your feet down, drive it like a regular motorcycle, but once you get used to it, you probably won't ever have to put your feet down at all. I found, because I haven't ridden one of these in a while, it took a little bit of a learning curve and I just drove up throwing my feet down, but obviously you can lock it. So something to keep in mind, once it's locked, as you can see, uh, well, I got the, no, I got the center stand on, that's why. But once it's locked um, like this, uh, you know, it, it stays upright. It can be pushed around your garage very easily. Uh, but yeah, it is an interesting system with that locking system. So that is a button you're gonna use fairly regularly. All right, so I realized that the best thing to do is just demonstrate what I was talking about. So it actually, I've just turned it on. It was leaning this way. We're gonna turn it on again one more time. Uh, put the brake in, start it up. We're gonna unlock that steering here, which we'll do right there. And you can see I can move it left to right like this. Now, if I lean it way over here, I can lock it up like that and it's leaned off, you know, it's sitting there on its own towards me. Now, I wanna be ready for it, so I'll unlock it here, and as I do that, it's free again. We'll lean it this way this time, whoops. It's locked again, it indicates in the dash, and it's leaning your way. So you can lean it any way you want when you park it, but what you're probably gonna to wanna to do is have it sit exactly like this. There we go, wasn't ready for that one. Lock it up like that. It probably won't fall over on you, but if you're doing things like I just did, it could. So we'll turn it off again. And again, that's how that locking system works. You can tap it when you're level. So the example I gave is not a great example of how you're gonna do it, but the point is, if those wheels are uneven, it will lock with the wheels uneven, allowing you to stay upright. That's how it works. So let's talk about who this is for, and I think it's kind of evolving from where it started. When it started, it was a bit of a curiosity that was great for cities and great for all weather, and it still has a place for people who want to replace a car with something small, efficient, and fun. And that's the key. This thing is an absolute blast. In the space of replacing a car, I think it's doing better than it's ever done. The backup camera, again, seems like something you don't need, but once you have it, I don't know if it's because I'm so used to backup cameras in cars now, it is helpful. It is a nice thing to have, I have to admit it. Same thing with the sort of the radar plate at the back here, which allows itself to see traffic, uh, which allows for that lane, the blind spot warning essentially. Uh, having that system, I think is really helpful on a motorcycle. Of course, you are more exposed here. So being able to have that look for traffic around you and being able to see in your peripheral vision, both in your mirrors and in the dash that there is traffic on either side of you allows you to look out forward all the time. You don't have to glance in your mirror to know if there's someone there. If that light is on, someone is there. Now you should still be scanning your mirrors and that kind of thing, 
but you can keep an eye on more things when the vehicle is also keeping an eye on things for you. So I still recommend, like everything with blind spot detection, to check your blind spot, check your turns before you go, but like I said, if that dash is lit up that there's someone there, then you don't have to check, you just know you can't turn there. Uh, so that gives you a little bit of more ability to keep an eye out on what's going on ahead of you. So where I think this is strong in North America, obviously all those European cities, that's a really strong thing, but this is a really quality touring bike that is great for all weather. You wanna head on on a vacation, you have set dates you wanna go regardless of the weather, get yourself a really good rain suit because you can handle the rain, but the vehicle itself can also handle the rain. It's a blast to drive in the dry, it's a blast to drive even when it's wet, keeps you clean, has cruise control. That little bit extra power probably wasn't needed but it will be appreciated. Again, better fuel efficiency, more torque, more horsepower, more accessible power, so better acceleration, all of that's included. And again, when I had my mic on with it running in here inside, it may have sounded loud to you. These mics pick up that noise pretty good. But I can tell you right now, when I started it outside, I thought, wow, this thing is quiet and even driving nice and quiet. So I appreciate that because it allows you to hear the traffic around you. Some people will say loud pipes save lives. I like to hear the traffic around me and, um, some of that has been debunked in the past. Anyways, great wind protection, great weather protection. This is a vehicle that can very, very much replace a car for a lot of people, and it's fun. So what did I leave out? What do you still wanna know about that? Let me know in, this, in the description of this video, or sorry, in the comments of this video, because here at Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals, I can come back to this again and again and again, and I wanna make sure I build a video database of information that you wanna know about this vehicle, and I, I can come back to it again and again. And if you wanna see this, we just had two delivered, one is already sold. This is the only one that we have in stock right now. So make sure you swing down to Fredericton, New Brunswick to check this out here at Jim Gilbert's Wheels and Deals, Jim Gilbert's Power Sports. Thanks everybody for watching.